Without further ado, I have the pleasure of welcoming John Manning with compiling your story. Hi, everyone. All right. Um, so I have a lot to get through and uh, disappointingly only three hours to do it. No, I'm only kidding. Um, so today, this is the good stuff uh, in this talk. I am going to tell you how symbolic execution works, how to use a theorem prover, how to pretend to run software without actually doing it, how to detect complicated bugs in video games, and also how to generate a saved game for a, a video game without ever playing it. So my name is John Manning. Uh, I am 50% of Secret Lab. Um, I am a programmer on Night in the Woods. Uh, people like that a lot. Um, I've also written books for O'Reilly. This is the credential slide. Um, and I'm also uh, the lead developer of Yarn Spinner. Yarn Spinner is a tool I'll be talking a lot about today. So Yarn Spinner was written for a game called Night in the Woods, uh, released in 2017, which is a game that has a lot of dialogue, a lot of player choice, about 25,000 lines of dialogue. Um, and uh, it's about this character on the right-hand side. Her name is May, and uh, she's a complete mess of a person. Um, so the games, m much of the game involves talking to characters. So like many other games, uh, it's a game in which you uh, have lines, you can make choices, you can choose what to say, and conversations play out as a result of those choices. The way that the, uh, the, the those lines and those choices are written is in a language called yarn. Yarn is uh, what you can see on screen here right now. So it's kind of a hybrid between a screenplay and a scripting language. It was a language designed for a writer who didn't want to have to learn how to program as well because he was also doing most of the art. Um, independent video games, everyone. So. Um, Yarn Spinner is the dialogue engine that, that was made for Night in the Woods. It was released as open source. Uh, it's been used in many other games since then, um, including a game by Cartoon Network, which is cool. Um, and it's available under the MIT license at yarnspinner.dev. Now, I'm not here to pitch the thing to you, although if you feel like being pitched at, let me know. Um, I am using this as the, the, the foundation for the majority of my talk here, because I, want, I needed to talk about uh, like the two main ways in which we tend to approach dialogue systems in video games, but also how we can use the, the differences between those two, two systems to relate that to compilers and how they convert your linear written code as text into the graph, which it then compiles. I'm also going to talk about how theorem provers can be used to help analyze these kinds of things and how we can apply the, that technique back to narrative. So, Let's talk about the two kinds of dialogue systems that there are. So the first one is node-based. So node-based, script-based, let's look at, we'll talk about node-based uh, first off. Um, so in a node-based dialogue system, we have lines of, dialogues, uh, lines of dialogue which are boxes, and the choices you can make are the lines between those boxes, whereas a script-based approach is lines of dialogue written in some kind of linear form, often a spreadsheet. So in a node-based approach, the dialogue is effectively a directed graph. So the vertices on the graph are the lines of dialogue, and the edges of the, of the, no, uh, uh, of the uh, graph are the choices. And any vertex with an out degree of more than one has interactive choice. That is, the uh, player is able to choose how they want to proceed from that point in the conversation. These, are, these kinds of tools, these node-based tools, are very popular uh, because it's very, very easy to understand the visual layout of a dialogue tree. Um, these are often built with a visual tool. They're very, very easy to read, and they're very, very easy to visualize, but they're fiddly to work with and write content because you must create a new node for every new line, which makes it quite tedious to quickly write new content. So a number of uh, things exist on the market, both open and closed source. Uh, some very popular ones being used in games these days are ChatMapper and RTC Draft. A lot of teams end up making their own internal tools as well that are specific to the needs of their title. Um, by contrast, a script uh, approach represents the dialogue tree as code. You type it in some programming language. So, for example, Double Fine, which is a well-known uh, game dev studio based out of San Francisco, uses Lua for, for this. So the lines of code are the dialogue, and you need to have special syntax to represent the, uh, those choices. Now, this requires that your writers have some degree of programming knowledge. It's easier to write this in because, you know, you're just typing text, but it can get harder to read because you can't look at the thing and get a picture of the, of the tree structure. So these tend to be almost exclusively internal tools. I'm not aware of very many uh, script-based uh, things uh, that exist outside of, uh, like, that you can just go and get apart from my tool. Um, but what if there was a third way? So the third way, of course, would be to combine the two. You create a node-based approach, but each node contains a full script. 
So this allows you to do a couple of really cool things. One is it, it, it combines the advantages of both systems. You can view the, the, the narrative structure in the, in the visual form, which the node-based approach lets you do, but also you can start writing lines of text much more quickly than you could create new nodes. Um, however, this requires the presence of a uh, custom tool. So, um, popular one, open source, called Twine. Twine is a beautiful little tool, um, and also if you came to the, uh, the games mini conf on Monday, uh, Tim Nugent gave an amazing talk on how to get started with Twine. Twine is designed for hypertext interactive fiction uh, stuff. So uh, it's less about running lines of dialogue, it's more choose your own adventure game type things, although uh, apparently we shouldn't use uh, that term because that term is trademarked and they're litigious. So um, another one is mine, Jan Spinner. So it is a Twine-inspired system designed for embedding into games uh, powered by a variety of engines. Uh, right now, mostly Unity. So Jan was used ex extensively in Night in the Woods. Uh, all of the dialogue, much of the gameplay, all implemented in this. So for example, here's a screenshot of some of the source code to uh, one character, the main character's mother. Um, and if we drill down, you can see uh, each node contains a chunk of script. It can contain a single line of dialogue. It can contain multiple lines. We leave that entirely up to the writer. Uh, generally, we find that writers prefer to create new nodes when there's an important branch in the plot, um, whereas smaller, less important choices can be kept within the nodes. So you can like, get a good, good idea of like, how branching a, a, a story is without having to worry about, do you say, I want sandwich or I want soup, when neither of those choices actually matter matter that much. So the scripting language itself is designed to be quite nice and simple, very, very little overhead in terms of like non-English language, non-human language stuff. So that's cool, but because this is a scripting language, we end up writing an entire parser and compilation chain for it, and because of that, we were able to have a number of features that come from having that kind of tool chain. So it would be nice to be able to do some things with dialogue trees, like analyze it programmatically, spot problems, spot logic errors, spot unreachable lines, look for broken states that would, that, that would make the, it impossible for the player to continue playing from that, that, that point. Uh, that's often called a soft lock. So we also want to be able to do tests without having to do all the legwork. Um, so it's quite tedious to test a conversation system because you have to start the game, load the level, walk up to the character, press the talk button, and then choose the right options in the right order to get to the line that you want to test. That's really quite tedious, and uh, QA engineers are just the best people in the world for doing it. Um, but we could save the game, but that wouldn't necessarily, or, or rather, we could jump directly to that line, but if we did, we aren't guaranteed that we are entering the game at the, uh, under the same circumstances that we would have if we had organically gone up to the character and started talking to them. So we, you're not having to plan those, uh, those paths. So how can we automate the testing and the bug checking of dialogue systems in games? Well, we have to realize that dialogue trees have a lot in common between um, trees and dialogue program, uh, uh, computer programs. So we step through them one line at a time in the same way as we step through instructions. We gather input. These inputs are always player choices from a limited set. Um, we can store some state, we can write to variables, and also we make decisions on what to do based on that kind of state. So because Yarn is a programming language, and because we've written a compiler, we realize something, we can do this kind of analysis using our existing tool set. So um, Yarn Spinner compiles its scripts to an internal bytecode in, in a manner very similar to other languages, Python, or at least the C implementation of Python, uh, .NET, Lua, these all do it, and also LLVM compiles to an internal bytecode as well. So this method of going from the high-level language to an intermediate representation for, for execution is really common. So let's look at the specific question of can we prove the reachability of a line? Can we prove that a certain line of dialogue in our game can be reached under some set of choices made by the player? Um, or more formally, um, uh, for any given part of the program, is there a way to prove that, that at least one set of inputs that program exists such that that line will be run? So we can do this using a computer. We can do it using static analysis. So static analysis is when uh, part of your parser or compiler tool chain looks at your code and figures out some information about it without having to run it. So compilers are doing this all the time. Anytime you see a compiler warning, that's the result of some degree of static analysis. 
And one kind of static analysis is, is a thing called uh, symbolic execution, which is the process of running, in air quotes, uh, the program without having knowledge of that program's inputs. So you aren't actually having to execute the program itself. You could even execute a subset of the program, even if you don't know the entire state of what the rest of the program would be, um, which means you can run it without having to know, knowing, know the contents of, of variables. So you deduce facts about what those variables could be rather than what they are. So let's make this a bit more concrete. Here's a program, it's written in Python, and I'd like to be able to prove that that last line where it says print your over the pi budget uh, can run under some set of inputs. Now, I can't know what's gonna run, uh, what, what's gonna come in when the user uh, responds to the question, how many pies? Um, so let's first of all start. We say, okay, pi price, we assign that to, to a variable. So we'll record what this would be. So under all circumstances, pi price's value would always be 3.14. And then we'd say numpies uh, is the result of uh, asking how many pies and converting that to an integer. Well, we don't really know what that could be without actually executing the program. So let's create a symbolic value and we'll call that pi. Then we'll go to the next line. We'll say pi owing is a result of multiplying pi price times numpies. So we, don't, we can't know the concrete value of that either because we don't know the value of one of the operands. So pi owing is whatever pi was times 3.14, which happens to be pi price. So if we are on that last line, that print your over the pi budget, the only way to get there is if that if statement evaluates to true, pi owing greater than 10. So what that means is if we're on here, pi owing greater than 10 is equal to true. So we've collected a bunch of information about the situation that this program would be in when we hit that line. So keeping in mind that whatever we represent uh, it as needs to have the same set of operations as the type of value that we're standing in for, we need to be able to ask questions like, is this value larger than or smaller than some other float? Whatever we decide pi is needs to be something that represents every possible number that could ever exist, which is kind of a big ask. So let's get slightly more abstract again, we can go to Z3. Z3 is an open source project from Microsoft. Uh, it is a satisfi satisfiability modulo theories prover, uh, solver rather, um, that is really cool. Um, I don't understand most of it, but I do know how to use enough of it. And you can install it using pip. So let's install that, well, excuse me. Uh, first of all, um, one kind of problem that Z3 can solve is here's a really simple logical syllogism. Um, uh, if it is raining, then I am wearing a raincoat. It is raining, therefore, I am wearing a raincoat. Fairly straightforward kind of, yep, yep. So, how would we represent that? Well, we could say, um, import everything from Z3 and declare the presence of two values. Uh, one called raining, which is a Boolean. One called raincoat, also Boolean. So that constrains the set of possible values that these two things can have. Then we say, if raining then raincoat is actually a relationship between raining and raincoat. It, we, we say that raining implies raincoat. If it is raining, I am wearing a raincoat. If raining is true, raincoat must be true. And then we say, okay, solve this. I assert two things. One, the relationship. Two, it is raining. And it will come back saying, well then, the solution for this is raining is true and raincoat is true. So this is Z3 solving that uh, logical syllogism, making a deduction. So let's go back to a pi example. We now have all the tools we need to answer that question, can we reach that line of dialogue? So here's our Python code. Here's the same Python code represented uh, in Z3. So pi price, okay, well, first of all, we'll, we'll declare that there's a, a variable called pi price, and we'll also assert the fact that that variable is equal to 3.14 under all circumstances. Then numpies. Remember, this is the value that we didn't know the value of and could not know the value of. So we declare that the value exists but we don't constrain it to a specific value. We just say, there's a value called numpies. Done. Next, pi owing can be declared by saying pi price times numpies. Same code uh, on either side, but the one on the right-hand side is setting up a relationship rather than imperatively declaring the value of some region of memory. And then finally, if we're here, then remember, if we're on that line, we must uh, be in a situation where pi owing greater than 10. So we can just, just assert that. We say to the solver, add pi's owing greater than 10. And then we can say, solve. What that will do is it'll produce either the term sat 
or unsat. Sat means that it is possible for all of the things we've added to the solver to be true at the same time. It won't tell you the value of numpies. In fact, num numpies could be in any number that we've ever thought of. It could be a million, it could be a million and one. So um, we are not asking it to uh, give us the value of numpies. We're just saying, is it possible for us to, for all this to be true? We can also say, What's a, what is one possible value of numpies? It will say four. He, so if numpies is four, then uh, four times 3.14 is guaranteed to be greater than 10. So that's basically showing its work. This is a way in which it could be. So that's great. But we haven't solved a bug yet. We've just shown some fancy logic stuff. So we're going to focus on a single uh, class of, of uh, bug today, which is the reachability problem. How can we prove that every part of your game's story, your game's dialogue, can be reached? So here is another Python uh, code, and there's a bug in it, and that bug is that line of code can never, ever be reached under any circumstances, no matter what value of A gets passed into this function. So that, that was, I wrote that by hand to make sure that that was impossible, but my machine was able to instantly tell me. I'm gonna show you how it figured it out, because we can then apply that to video game dialogue. So the way we do it is we find every possible path through the program. We symbolically execute every one of those paths, and as part of doing that, we can detect those paths that could never run. And a, code, a line of code is unreachable if there are no paths that are possible and can go through that point. So how do we find those paths? So compilers produce bytecode, and we can take that raw bytecode and build a graph, and then analyze that graph. So CPython, for example, the C implementation of Python, um, is compiled to a bytecode. That bytecode gets executed. And we can see that disassembly. Uh, the dis module in Python can give this to you. So on the left is the source code of uh, my, my, my buggy program. And on the right-hand side is the, uh, the Python bytecode that's represented there. You never actually type this in. This is actually just a human readable version of the, of, of the bytecode. No one actually uh, types a Python assembly, and with good reason. Um, so, like, when we say x is zero, then what we're doing is we're loading the constant zero and storing it in the, in the, in the slot one, which is mapped to x. And then, yeah, when we say as, if a is greater than zero, we're setting up the, the virtual machine and asking it, okay, now run this operator, and then if that uh, went to false, then jump to somewhere else in the program, so, and so on and so forth. So, how do we turn that soup of instructions into a path, into a graph that we can draw paths through. Well, one way is through uh, so-called basic blocks. A basic block is a run of instructions that only ever enters at the top and leaves at the bottom. You never ever leave a basic block halfway through. Um, and analysis is way easier if you know that constraint about your nodes. So how do we make our basic blocks? Well, you take your list of instructions, and you mark each instruction as the start of a block if it's either the first instruction in the program, the target of a jump from somewhere else, the instruction after a conditional jump, or the instruction after a stop instruction. And then all the other instructions are then grouped up into the, in, into the previous uh, 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 instructions block. So let's uh, start by turning this into basic blocks. Here's a big long list of instructions. This one here. We know that, that we start from the first one there because it's the first instruction. And we run all the way down there to a, uh, to a jump because that jumps elsewhere. Then the next block, that's an instruction following a conditional jump, so it must begin another basic block. And so we can perform this process of building all of the basic blocks. Now we know uh, which single basic block each instruction belongs to. Once we have this, we can start to, to create the graph between these things. Blocks have predecessors, that is the blocks that can, that can lead into them. Blocks can have successors, that's the blocks that, that, that can follow them. And blocks that uh, end in an unconditional jump always have one successor, which is the, the block that they're jumping into. So a block that ends in a conditional jump will have two successors, the true, uh, sorry, uh, the target that it's jumping to, as well as the following block. Blocks in the stop have no successes because they stop the program, and any other block has one successor, which is the following instruction. All right, so here's our blocks, and we can rearrange that into a graph. And so now we know 
the possible ways we could go through this program, at, depending on what decisions get made at these conditional jumps. So these are the points in which program flow could change. So just a map from one to the next, there are, uh, I'm not going to count all the, the different ways you can go through, but there's, there's a few, not a huge number, but there's a few. Now, let's look at the condition in which uh, the first if statement is true, and the second one is also true. All right, so what, which, which path is that? Well, that's this path going through uh, these nodes. All right, so zooming in, let's, let's start symbolically executing this program. So we start here. We uh, can see what's, what, what's stored in X at the start of the program. All paths go through the bit that stores a value in X, so it stores zero. But we have a load of whatever value is in A, and we don't know what A is. So we declare that A is some value that we know nothing about. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to call it cat. All right. So now, because we're following this specific path, we know, now know that that's true. If we came from the true path, then we now know that the only way to get to this point is if a is greater than zero. Now, because the value a contains, sorry, because the variable a contains the value cat, that must mean that cat is greater than zero. We've gained some information about this value. We don't know its specific value, but we do know some information about it. So under all circumstances, cat is greater than zero. Great. Following the path that we've decided for ourselves, we assign, uh, a, we have, have followed a, a, this path here and go, okay, we also now know that uh, a, uh, a is less than five, therefore the value cat is less than five as well. So now, let's get you on. We've set uh, x is one now. Okay, so, so uh, we've changed the value of x, and I'll come back to ch how we change variables later on as well, because it's complex. So, all right. And now we're on to uh, this next part here. So we've gone through a point, uh, the program will always reach this point where we say there's a value b and it's, value, it's equal to a plus one. Okay, cool. So we can derive more information then about the value b because we know that b is a plus one, a is cat, therefore b is less than six and b is greater than one. So we're getting more and more information about the possible values of these variables. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next part following that yellow arrow there. So now we have asserted uh, x is already one, so I'll, I'll leave that off for, for, for space. Follow the, uh, the yellow arrow. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So now we have these sets of constraints and we're ready to print hello. So we're here if all of those things are true at the same time. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so we have a problem. B cannot be less than six and greater than six at the same time. Um, at least not with, you know, human mathematics. N not these kinds of human mathematics. So we've just proven that path, that whole path in which we take uh, the if statement goes true and the if statement goes true, that, can't, that path can never be run. And by following uh, all of the other paths that pass through the print hello block, we can also prove that they're, they're invalid as well. I won't show the working for, for everything, but it's the same, it's the same process. And what we end up with is there are no paths that can go through that block, which means that that, that line of code, that print hello, can never be run under any circumstances. So we can treat dialogue trees in the exact same way as we treat control flow graphs, like we just saw, and we can apply the same techniques. So let's look at how this was uh, done in Night in the Woods. Night in the Woods has a very large story, a lot of complexity in how the game works, at the high level, where we're asking questions like, how far through the plot are we? And also at the low level, where we're asking questions like, when I walk up to this character, can I talk about this topic because of past history? There are lots of characters in this game. They all have their own state to keep track of over the course of the game. So. Specifically, let's look, look, look at one character. Her name is Laurie. She's a character that you meet, uh, you can meet her quite early on in the game. And uh, certain activities uh, that you can do in the game become available based on your conversation choices with her, but also uh, what you've done elsewhere in the game, not directly related to her. So she's tied into a lot of different parts of the game. All right. So also, Laurie is kind of cool because um, I, I like the character, and also her dialogue is quite short lines, making it very good for this presentation. So. Here's the first conversation that you can have with Laurie. Uh, it, it actually begins with a test to see if we're late in the game. But if you look down the bottom here, like if we're not late in game, then we kick off a bunch of other uh, lines. So um, this is like part of her source code. So 
Yarn spinner is reading one execution at a time, uh, sorry, one instruction at a time and executing it. Um, and it uses a stack-based virtual machine, very similar to Python, C Python. So this is an example of uh, that source code as compiled into Yarn spinner bytecode. Very, very similar to how C Python's doing it. Most of the instructions are run line because that's the main goal of this system. And so this is Laurie's source code when converted to a control flow graph. Um, don't try and read it. I'm really unincluding it to impress you. Um, <laughs> control flow graphs for nightly with characters tend to be quite complex because of the large number of checks involved on deciding what lines to run. So here's a part of the conversation where uh, Laurie is talking to May, the main character, about a mural elsewhere in the game's world that's been vandalized. And uh, so let's see what would happen if we wanted to prove these lines are reachable. Well, we have a giant, um, uh, in, simply enormously huge uh, graph here. And so I was able to find those paths in the little demo program, the little toy program, by hand. But I'm not going to do that for this. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, try and find all the paths using a... Uh, uh, and also, yeah, using a tool called uh, Network X. Network X is a great tool for working with graphs in Python. Um, and you can ask it things like, give me all the simple paths that go from one point to the next without having any kind of cycles. So once I ask Network X for that, I get this kind of graph. Each one of these arrows is a possible path through the program. And I had to zoom in on a very small part of the graph because the whole thing just gets huge. The PDFs go into the megabytes, and it's only text. Um, so, uh, that's all right, good to know, large complicated thing, but that's fine because that's the program, uh, the, the computer's job to solve. It'll take every single one of those paths and perform symbolic analysis, symbolic execution to, uh, to try and determine if the path is possible under any, uh, under any possible circumstance. So here's how the paths arrive at our target node where we discussed the vandalized mural. Now, are any of them actually valid? Well, some of them we actually care about the validity of uh, more than others. So, for example, uh, if you take a look at uh, over on the uh, right-hand side, um, center right, uh, can I? Yeah, cool. So right there, and I apologize to everyone watching this uh, later or on stream who can't see my laser pointer. That's the only time we'll do that. Um, there is a node with a single line going into it. There's only one path that leads to it which means if that path is invalid, there's no way to run those lines of dialogue, which have been written, edited, copy edited, translated. So we want to make sure that uh, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. So, oh. All right, so <laughs> how, can we how can we derive uh, these constraints using Z3? Well, we take our, our basic blocks, we identify the possible entry box, entry box and exit blocks. So entry blocks are any ones that are marked as we can start here, and exit blocks are ones that have no successes. We find the paths, and then we uh, execute it. Now, executing in this case really means running it, but every time we set a variable, we're actually not recording that in memory. We aren't saying, okay, store the number in the variable. We're actually creating a new assertion saying that a variable exists and it is mapped to this value. And then also, finally, for conditional uh, jumps, so if statements, we know what path we're taking, so we actually just assert that if it's a, a, an if branch, if we're taking the true path, we assert that the, the uh, relationships used by that if statement are true. So we now have the complete set of constraints for the path. And so what we get is, so, oh, one thing that I should point out, I mentioned before that changing variables can get complicated. That's because um, if I say x equals 1, x is now 2, y equals x plus 1. The naive approach to this would be to say, OK, there are two variables, x and y. And I say x is 1, x is 2, y equals x plus 1. And Z3 is going to say unsat. Those three things cannot all be true at the same time. x cannot be 1 and 2. So what we have to say instead is there are three variables, x at the start of the program, x later in the program, and the single value that y is set to. And so we say x1 is 1, x2 is 2, y1 is the latter version of x plus 1. And that is satisfiable, because now we are able to build, uh, these all can be, can, can be true at the same time. So that adds some complexity. Every time we set a variable in our symbolic execution, we're actually creating a brand new value. And that means that memory usage can get real big. So um, that, this approach actually has to be used in LLVM. This is a chunk of LLVM, low-level uh, instruction language. And you'll notice the things marked with a percentage sign in front of it are, in fact, uh, the registers 
the, the LVM machine assumes an infinite number of registers, um, and they're only ever being assigned to once. Because when you know that a variable is only ever assigned to once, you can get a, you get a lot more flexibility. This is called single static assignment. So single assignment, and they're also uh, never changing after that. So we end up having to like record the history of these, uh, of these things. So for conditional jumps as well, um, I mentioned before that we assert the fact that an if statement's uh, condition is true. So that becomes another set of things in the, uh, in the set of constraints we're deriving as we take these paths. So um, we also, like most of the code is actually pretty simple because the plus operator for, in Python is the same for numbers as it is for Z3 values. So, you know, I actually wrote the add uh, operation once and then just run it feeding in, in different values. That's an example of uh, dynamic typing being amazing. Thanks, Python. So we have built up a collection of assertions. We then feed them all into Z3, and we ask them, are these assertions satisfiable? Can they all be true at the same time? If it replies, no, they all, th th these can't all be true at the same time, that means that path is not possible, and we remove it. And so we are able to extract it. So is it possible to go from the entry point to this point? Yes. And in fact, it says, yes, and here's how. Because this is the collection of possible ways to get there. If you are on that point, then one of these uh, clauses in this giant or statement is true. So it's able to build up an enormous uh, set of possible uh, ways to get there. Um, it tries to simplify it as much as it can, but this it was like about 20 pages long. Um, and that's fine. So for example, um, one way to get there is looking at the first option. Uh, De the variable demo zero is equal to zero. It is not the case that met lorry is equal to zero. It is not the case that the act variable contains one, and so on and so on and so on. So here's one possible way. So it's act two, day one. You have spoken to lorry before. You can do lorry's friendship quest. That's an internal name for like a thing you can go and do with lorry. You've already, you're not strangers. Um, you haven't spoken about the mural before, and when you start the conversation, you have not already spoken to lorry that day because you can't talk about it. You, you can't go twice in one day, have you heard about this? Because that's just weird for the player. So yeah, all these different variables can be, uh, can be set and known to be in these values. Now, we can use this to provide uh, an explanation for why we can't reach certain code, but we can also uh, find ways in which we can't reach a line. Here's a bit of yarn code that contains a bug. Uh, that third option there, where Greg is saying the line y can never run, and the bug is because uh, of that, uh, of a typo in else if Greg greater than one, because it requires Greg's, uh, uh, it requires Greg to be greater than two, but not greater than one, which is a mathematical impossibility. And so we can ask Jan Spinner to, to prove why. We can say, okay, is it possible to reach there? Uh, no, there's only one way to get there, and it's impossible, and here's why. These are the two things that are uh, in, uh, in, incompatible with each other. This is the thing that Z3 can pr produce called an unsat core. That is the, uh, the, the minimal set of equations that are incompatible with each other. So we can actually now say, okay, it's unreachable, and here's why. So now we can take this and make it a little bit more interesting, because we can run this in reverse. So I mentioned before that testing conversations can be quite repetitive. You have to go to the characters, say the things in the right order, and if you make a mistake, then you ruin that whole run. Or we could just jump to a straight uh, a line of dialogue, but I mentioned before, that can be tricky because you know, we aren't guaranteed to have the same state that we would get. It would not, not be representative of player experience. So what we can do is we can take the set of constraints that, um, that that we've, that we've uh, produced, and then ask Z3 for a model. So given this information here, give me values for these variables. Now I've built a save game. I never had to run the game at all, but now I have a save game that's valid for getting to that point in the game. So we can jump straight into the conversation. Now you can get more out of this if you can declare some invariant rules about how your story works, which might not be ever part of the code, but do act as the underlying groundwork for your story. So uh, you can declare facts that are always true, and when you combine those facts with the derived assumptions that, the, uh, uh, that Z3 is finding as it runs the paths, you're able to get a more complete set of facts about the world. In Night in the Woods, uh, there are two characters that are uh, particularly important to the game. Um, so Greg and B. Uh, so Greg is the wolf and uh, B is the crocodile or alligator. I'm not entirely sure. Um, 
And uh, these characters have a number of friendship quests. So that's things like hanging out, uh, doing some character development, uh, important conversations, that kind of stuff. If by late game you've hung out with one character more than the other, then the game declares that it is your main friend and uh, they become particularly important further in the game. So here's the source code in Nightly Woods that does that. Every night when May goes to sleep, this code gets run. And if it's the start of Act 2 uh, and the start of, uh, of Day 3, and you have done more B friendship quests than you've done with Greg, then we say uh, dominant friend B to 1. Otherwise, we set dominant friend Greg to 1. So that's, that's that code. That gets run every time. And it only actually kicks off on Act, act 2, Day 3. But here's another way to represent that in, in human language. Now, these aren't lines of code to run. These are facts that are always true at every instant of gameplay. So if act is greater than two and day, day is greater than three, then either Greg or, or B are your friend. It is never the case that they're, they're both your friend at the same time. And if Greg is your main friend, it's because you did more quests with him than with B, and vice versa. If B is your main friend, you did more quests with her than with Greg. Okay. Now, we can turn that into formal logical notation. So we can enter this into Jan Spinner's uh, checker, and then this helps to form its understanding of the story world. So uh, act greater than or equal to two, and day greater than or equal to three, implies dom friend B, X or dom friend Greg. And so we can just use that to build up this set of logical equations. We can then feed that into the dialog system checker, and it's able to derive even more possible ways to, uh, to say this could never be run because of larger, broader story concerns. So we can also use that to help generate an even more complete uh, game state. So um, if I'm like at this point here in the game, then it's able to use that uh, invariant condition that I had set up to say, oh, and also act must be on this state, and also B is your main friend. And like more information about that. Now this kind of thing has a number of important consequences for production of games. So the video game Mass Effect 3, released in 2012, big, expensive space opera, a um, lot, lot of money and resources. Many of you in the room may have played it. Um, it was a game that was fully voice acted. The main character uh, has a choice of two genders. Um, it is fully translated into seven languages. So you can do the multiplication in your head. Um, thank you. Well done. So, <laughs> so um, the nerds, the blessed nerds who modify this game, have been tearing this thing apart because they want to be able to modify the dialogue itself. And it turns out one of the constraints uh, on the people doing the mods is they want to, that you can only replace dialogue. It's very hard to add new lines of dialogue. And so they're looking for lines of dialogue that uh, can be safely removed and replaced with their own fan fiction. And uh, the nerds were able to analyze the code and find stuff like, well, this here. So uh, 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 Sam's, uh, Sam, who's a character in the game, uh, has something that happens to them. And they found that the conversation will never make it to this point uh, and all the lines dependent on it, despite the presence of the lines being in the game. So they've been written, translated, edited, debugged, ideally, voice acted. Voice acting involves the actor, the director, the engineers, the studio time, transit, etc. Et Storage space on disk, memory usage uh, on the client uh, machine, enormous amounts of stuff. And they'll never, ever be run. This, all that effort was wasted. Now, it's a relatively minuscule amount compared to the rest of the game, because the rest of the game you know, works, but those lines don't. And that was wasted resources. So how can you use this in your uh, in your work? Well, compile these kinds of things, dialogue trees or programs, to some intermediate representation. You can generate basic blocks from the representation and generate the control flow graph from that. You can then find the possible paths that go through the program. Um, and whenever you encounter a variable that you don't know, you can say, well, it's some, some symbolic value. And you can assert facts about that symbolic value. And you can find lines that are never run. Now, this set of techniques is not foolproof. Uh, the main problem with symbolic execution is, it is a, that a complex program may have a very large number of possible paths, especially if the program has, uh, contains loops. Um, Night in the Woods does not. Um, in, uh, in fact, uh, my version of this code actually detects loops and then bails out, saying, I can't, I'm not even going to touch this. Um, so, yeah, loops are common in many programs, and there are ways around this, but uh, not one that I have time for to talk about today. So, 
our dialogue tree is a code, and they can be analyzed using the same things we apply uh, code tools to. So you can use it to find logic errors, you can use it to make testing easier, and that testing can save more than just development time. So thank you very much. So for more information, um, my studio is on Twitter, The Secret Lab. Uh, for more information about Yarnspinner, it's Yarnspinner Tool. Uh, we're also on the web at yarnspinner.dev. Uh, Z3 is on GitHub. And also, please consider backing my Patreon, where we can develop Yarnspinner even more. All right. Um, I think we've got some time for questions. Yes. Uh, cool. All right. Who's a question? Um, I remember back in uni, we were actually told about like symbolic analysis. We were always told it was too slow to use. Like, how long roughly did it take to run this through Night in the Woods? Because it's not like it's a small game. So I haven't run all of this through the entirety of Night in the Woods uh, because the game's already shipped, and so finding bugs was less important. But for generating, uh, I, I did mo much of this after the game shipped, um, but I'm using it for future work now. Uh, I can tell you that for doing the analysis of Laurie, it took about 30 seconds to run the possible uh, paths from that start point to that end point. I've also used this tool to, um, uh, when the game was being translated into Japanese, they, uh, the Japanese translators asked, is there a way for us to uh, find the set of runs through the program that allows us to guarantee that we'll see every single line of dialogue? Uh, and we want to m minimize the number of paths that uh, we have to run. And I said, yeah, I can, I can solve that problem, problem for you. And it took about an hour to generate every possible uh, a set of runs through the game that is guaranteed to reach every reachable line of code. So, yeah, it's like, it's nowhere near as slow as it used to be. But it's not quick. But it's also a thing that you can do offline. It doesn't require to be run, you know, at interactive frame rates. So, cool. Any other questions? Um, would you be able to use the theory here for uh, other applications like um, verifying that procedurally generated levels are not stuffed up or hmm. other kind of... See, where that becomes complicated is how you define stuffed up. Like, is an area in the level reachable? Um, uh, is, is the red door always able to be unlocked because you, have the, because you can get to the red key, that kind of stuff? You, if you're able to, to translate this into a set of like, logical constraints, then yes. But that itself is a separate task. So, yeah, y the answer is yes in conjunction with another one. I think we had a question in the, in the corner here as well. So, is your Turing complete? Uh, yes. Okay, so, so you, you, there's no way you can find every, every reachability question. So you're looking at just trying to optimize the ones that are yeah. easiest to find. That's right. Um, and do you, I'm curious then, do you ever run into situations where you're, you're basically like, like you think you can look for that one and then you just run and run and you have to give up? Is, has that happened frequently as you've been writing these tests? Never actually in my experience so far. Oh, good. Um, but that's mainly, uh, mainly because we don't, ha like all of the graphs are, are acyclic. And that makes it a lot easier uh, for us to, to prove because we can find every single possible path because there's now a finite set of paths. So, yeah. Danny? So, do your, all your story writers write code to do this? Or is there more of a, a collaborative? So, they write this kind of code, but it's often in conjunction with a programmer who is helping them like, set up the scene. So for example, early, early versions of this involved um, the programmer uh, creating like, uh, placeholders like, character will, will walk in and say a joke here, and then write code to go, if, oh, if, if this test here, then move on to, to, to other parts. And so like, because it's text, we can check into, uh, into Git and uh, do lots and lots of really nice collaboration uh, very easily. What we do tend to find is um, writers who have never programmed before do tend to pick up just the basics of how like, logic flow works. But like, the little things like um, the lead writer did not realize that if statements must be followed by an end if, because in human speech, we don't say end if. And so he never thought to include that. So, to answer your question in a roundabout way, yes, sort of, but they don't have to. Cool. Last question? Uh, I guess I'll ask the obvious question. Um, did you find unreachable blocks in Night in the Woods? I did. I found one. Um, 
Yeah, uh, so, the, uh, so the main character can practice playing her bass guitar in her room at, uh, in the evening, and uh, depending on how well she plays the bass guitar, that is how many notes she misses in the Guitar Hero style game that we have, uh, she'll either say, wow, I'm great, that was less than ideal, or wow, I'm terrible, and there's a bug that causes that middle option to never get run, so she'll either say, I'm amazing, or I'm the worst. Uh, <laughs> But like, real life. real life, basically, <laughs> yes. So, uh, and like, that's not a critical issue. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, there, there part of the reason why there aren't that many like critical, there aren't, to my knowledge, any critical story breaking, breaking bugs is because the game was being tested by an enormous number of people overnight, all the time. Um, so, uh, Becca Saltzman, who uh, was a CEO, is a CEO of Finji, the publisher, um, has played the game, I think, at least four hundred times, start to finish. This is a 12-hour game. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Becca. <laughs> cool. All right. I think that's it. Thank you all so much for coming.